Hi, this is Chaplain Greg again with the Wandering Wesleyan and our Walking in the Word series. We're continuing with our look at the Torah and we're in Exodus. And uh, where we left off last week, Moses has just come down from the mountain. He has the Ten Commandments. And uh, unlike Charlton Heston in the movies, he doesn't break them right away. But he has a big celebration and all the people agree that these Ten Commandments, the first four dealing with God's relationship with humanity and humanity's relationship with God, and the second uh, six having to do with um, having to do with humanity's relationship with each other, these Ten Commandments are presented and all the people agree, yes, we're going to live by these. Now, Moses is called back up to the mountain. And through chapters 25 through 31 of Exodus, big chunk, he is given the instructions on how to build this thing called the tabernacle. What is the tabernacle? The tabernacle was going to be the place where God dwells with his people. This is going to be where God is going to settle in and he is going to be the God of his people and be present with his people. All the instructions were given to Moses, not just on the tabernacle, but also on the priests and how the priests look and the different clothes that they would uh, be wearing. So Moses get these, gets all of these instructions, chapter 21 through 25 through 31. However, while Moses is up there, the people kind of panic. He's up there for a long time. And even though they've had this huge celebration declaring that the Ten Commandments are what they're going to live by, what do they do? They panic and they ask Aaron to create a god for them to worship. Because obviously this god has taken Moses and they're left alone in the wilderness even though he's providing manna for them every day even though he's providing water in the midst of a desolate place they panic they want to they want an idol and the people demand that Aaron create a god since they they think Moses has been killed and they create a golden calf now why a calf this is probably reflecting the god Apis from the Egyptian uh, pantheon of gods. And as they have this celebration of this new calf god, um, it turns out into an all-out orgy. Um, just all, basically every single command is broken in one shot. God tells Moses, hey, while they're up there, he says, this is happening down here. The people have abandoned me. I've had it. Because they've been grumbling, complaining the whole time. Yeah, I only freed you guys. I only brought you out here so that you could become a nation and a people. I fed you, I gave you water, and now you're, you're doing all this. You're completely going against your word. That's it, I've had it. We're going to wipe you out. And Moses intercedes for the people. He says, remember that covenant you had with Abraham. And remember that other nations are watching what happens to Israel. See, it isn't that... It isn't that Moses is trying to change... It, it isn't that Moses changed God's mind. But God is reminding Moses of who he is. And he's bringing to mind that even though this horrible thing has happened and the people deserve to be wiped out, God is going to show mercy. There's going to be justice, but there's also going to be mercy. God relents. He says, okay, the people are going to be punished. And Moses goes down, sees this drunken orgy of worshiping this idol, and then these tablets that he has with all of the instructions on the tabernacle and the priests, how to bring God's presence into the nation of Israel. That is what he breaks. Do you see that? The sin and the debauchery of the people of Israel 
broke the presence of God, pushed away the presence of God. They repent. They have a plague sent on them. Thousands die. And they go back to saying, okay, Moses, you and God know what you're doing. Moses then goes back up to Sinai. He gets new tablets, new instructions. And at the end of the book, the tabernacle is finished. They construct the tabernacle. Now, I want to read for you one verse. And this is an important verse. Moses, while he's up on the mountain, asks God to show him his presence. He wants to see God. And God says, you can't see me face to face. You'll die. You, 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 you can't do it. But I'll show you my back. But what kind of God is it that we're serving? So I'm going to read for you from Exodus 34, starting at verse 5. And the Lord came down in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed his name, the Lord, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed. So now the Lord is going and Moses is seeing his back. And the Lord proclaimed, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth. A faithful love, that is the word chesed in, in, in Hebrew. And when we get to the Psalms, I'm going to post a sermon that I gave on that very word chesed. It's a very important word, but it means, it has like 50 different translations, maybe even more but it essentially means God's faithful, everlasting, never-ending love. Abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished. Mercy, now justice. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. This is the kind of God we serve. We, God, we serve a God who is abounding in mercy and forgiveness. In, throughout the entire <coughs> scriptures, throughout all of scripture, never once does a person turn in repentance, sorrowful, true repentance towards God and is refused. God always, always, always forgives a repentant heart. But for those that don't repent, for those that continue in sin, for those that continue in their ways, there is justice. There's justice now, or there could be justice in the, in the everlasting, in, in eternity. But God will bring justice. That's the God we serve. So Moses comes back down having seen God, having seen just the rear end of God, and his face is glowing. It's glowing with the presence of God. And the rest of the book of, of Exodus is all about the building of this tabernacle and of the building of all of our different uh, outfits that the priests have to wear. And at the end of the book, we have this tabernacle and God's presence fills the tabernacle with glory, with this glory cloud. And guess what? Moses can't go in. Disappointing, right? How can Moses go in? How can people enter into the presence of God? Well, that's in the next book. So now we enter the book of Leviticus. And in the book of Leviticus, it's kind of a weird book. Yeah. It's a weird book because there's a lot of stuff in there that we just can't resonate with. A lot of laws, a lot of rules and regulations. But it's so worth reading because Moses can't enter into God's presence without Leviticus. Why? Because Leviticus is all about God's holiness. God is holy. God is set apart. 
He's creator. Remember we talked about in Genesis, in, in, in the first three chapters of Genesis, how he is the creator and separated from the creation. He's distinct from the creation. And not only is he holy, but all around him is holy. Moses in the burning bush, Moses had to take off his shoes in order to enter into God's presence because all around the burning bush was holy ground. Leviticus is the way for unclean to become clean and for unholy to enter into the presence of God. Now, there's a division in Leviticus. And once you understand that division and the five different divisions, becomes easier to read so the first part is all about ritual so chapters 1 through 7 and chapters 23 through 25 have to do with ritual 1 through 7 have to do with the rituals of sacrifices and offerings where chapters 23 through 25 have to do with feasts now, why why are those important? Well, first of all, sacrifices atone for or pay for sin. It involves death and the blood of animals. Now, the feasts, the feasts are for the people, and it's for them to remember their history and to have a yearly time of reflection and atonement. So that's the first section. So they're kind of bookended. 1 through 7, and at the end, 23 through 25. Let's move into the second section. And this is all about the priests. So verses 8 through 10 have to do with the ordination of the Levites from the line of Aaron. Okay, remember where I said Judah is kind of put off. He, Judah is the chosen tribe to lead Israel. But the Levites are important now because they've been chosen to be the priests of Israel from the line of Aaron. So we've narrowed it down to a particular tribe and a particular family in that tribe who are going to be the priests. It's all about, what chapters 8 through 10 is all about their ordination. Chapters 21 through 22, again, we got these bookends. 21 through 22 talks about the qualifications to become priests. It's all about holiness and moral integrity. Chapters 21 through 22 are important because Aaron's sons right after this they desecrate god's sanctuary and are killed it doesn't take them long does it before they go against what god has told them to do so the first section ritual chapters 1 through 7 23 through 25 the second section priests section uh chapters 8 through 10 and then chapters 21 through 22 the next section is purity. Purity. This is chapters 11 through 15 and 18 through 20. And this is where some of the tough stuff is. Purity is a state of being clean. What does it mean to be clean or unclean? There are some folks that believe being clean or unclean has to do with a state of sin. That's not the case. Clean or unclean has more to do with what we had called, remember, the stink of death. Remember that in the fall, we, in, in, in uh, chapter 3 of Genesis, we talked about the stink of death being on humanity because of the fall. So, a woman who is having the, her monthly visitor would be in a state of uncleanliness. Is she sinning? No. How about a soldier that goes out and fights a battle and gets all covered with muck and mire and blood and guts? Is he sinning? Well, if he's fighting for the right reasons and God has told the army to go fight, no, he's not sinning. Blood, bodily discharges, and skin diseases, skin diseases show up here, all are unclean because it's a reminder of death. Being unclean isn't necessarily a sin. If you sin, you're, un you're necessarily unclean. Let's put that out there. A person sins, they are necessarily unclean. But being unclean doesn't necessarily mean that you have sinned. The point is, is that when something's unclean, 
when you touch that unclean thing, that uncleanliness can transfer to you. So think of it if you've ever had a dog. And I had a dog when I was a kid, and her name was Libby. And Libby got into a skunk one day. Nasty. And so we had to wash her with tomato juice and, and try and get the stink off of her. And even after the tomato juice bath, she kind of stunk. Did I want to touch her? No. Why? Because I was afraid that stink would get on me. It's the same kind of thing. Think of the woman in uh, the Gospels who had the bleeding problem. She was unclean for 12 years. And she was separated from the community as unclean for 12 years. And the risk that she took when she went up to touch Jesus, risking that she would make him unclean, but instead she was healed. Why? Because only God can make the unclean clean. See, when humans touch unclean things, they become unclean. And there's rituals in Leviticus that talk all about that. How do you become clean again? But when we receive a touch and an encounter from God, all that death, that uncleanliness is wiped away. We can't make the holy unclean, but the holy can make us clean. When touching someone or something that is unclean, it's the stink of death. But when God touches us, he makes us new. Now, right in the middle, in between these three sections, the ritual, the priests, and the purity, is chapter 16 and 17. Chapter 16 and 17. And this is the Day of Atonement. This is Yom Kippur for our Jewish friends. This is for all the sins of Israel. And there's two parts. The first part is purification. So you pick two goats, and there's also a bull and a ram involved. But let's think about the two goats. And these two goats are presented at the temple, at the tabernacle, and they're presented at the entrance of the tent. One is for purification, and the other is what we call the scapegoat. The purification goat is killed and the blood of that goat is sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant is in the section of the tabernacle. Now you have the outside of the tabernacle, which is the courtyard where all of the killing goes on and the burning. And inside there's the holy place. And in the middle of the holy place is the holy of holy place. And in the Holy of Holy Places is the Ark. And in the Ark is manna. It is the Ten Commandments. And it's Aaron's budding staff. All of that you get when you read through the Torah. And, and, it, and it all makes sense. But the blood of the, of, the, um, of the sacrifice goat, of the cleansing goat, is sprinkled on the Holy of Holies. This is the only time the priests can go into the Holy of Holies and be in that presence of God. The sacrifice, the purification, and the goat sprinkled blood on the ark, and this is the only time. The scapegoat, so this is the second part, the scapegoat is then sent out into the wilderness. So it's an imagery of the forgiveness of sins and then the forgetting of sins, sending them out really important all of this has to do with humanity finding a way to be in god's presence chapters 26 through 27 at the end is a call of covenant faithfulness a call to obey the law so peace blessing fruitfulness what happens when we disobey Death, misery, famine, exile. Remember that. Part of the penalty for sin in the land is exile. 
and it's the same choice our first parents had in the garden. They chose to disobey and to do it their way, and they were exiled from the garden. Israel repeatedly, over and over again, ad nauseum, chose to do it their way, and eventually they were exiled. But that's way down the path. we got a lot more to go. So next week, we're going to finish up the Torah. And until then, this is Chaplain Greg. If you like this channel, if you like what you're watching, please subscribe and like and uh, share with other folks. And until next week, God bless.